Let me pray for us, and we will get started with this. Blessed Lord, thank you again just for saving, for shepherding, for upholding in ways that we know and don't know. And I do pray for everybody, dear Lord, for mental strength, spiritual strength, alertness. I pray you will bless your word as it goes forth. I pray that you will bring about many multiplications of what it is that we're learning, that people will be saved by the testimony that people will use from what we've learned from the Gospel of Mark, and that saints will be edified, the church built up. And we pray that you'll bless our time together. We commit this to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I am in Mark chapter 3, starting at... Da, 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 just real, real briefly... Chapter 3, we'll start with verse 7 and work our way down just to note a couple of things. There's others that will go from this. Verse 7 of chapter 3, when Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, that's the Sea of Galilee. Everything, of course, is Galilee-focused at this point. That's why when you come to chapter 10 and you got the journey to Jerusalem, it really does change from Galilee, and we'll see some things tomorrow with this, but all this is still in Galilee. Verse 7, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and also from Judea and from Jerusalem. Look at all the places. This is really spreading out because word of him has grown already by chapter 3. When it opens up, it's pretty much the people of Galilee that are coming there. Now it's down to Jerusalem and Judea and from Idumea down beyond the Jordan and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon, that's Gentile territory, that'd be north of them, a great multitude heard of all that he was doing and came to him. And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the multitude in order that they might not crowd him. Hmm. Again, the very busy Jesus with this. For he had healed many with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed about him in order to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits beheld him, they would fall down before him and cry out and say, You are the Son of God. First verse of Mark chapter 1 says the same thing. You are the Son of God. He earnestly warned them not to reveal his identity. Everything that we have seen, we're just going to go kind of briefly over that part. Everything that we saw before fits with Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. Very, very busy Jesus, very crowded Jesus. Even to the point that he has to sit in a boat so that the multitudes don't swarm upon him. He can't stand on the land. There are that many people. And then in verse 13... Through 15, we need to note some things. Verse 13, he went up to the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted. And they came to him. Now this would be the parallel passage where we started in Matthew chapter 10. This is where the 12 disciples are going to become the 12 apostles. Now we don't see it spelled out here the way that we saw it spelled out in Matthew chapter 10. But it is important that he went up to the mountain, they summoned the ones that he himself wanted, and they came to him. If you mark your Bibles, verse 14, this is so fitting. And he appointed 12 that they might, look at this, look at the order, so important, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach in that order. And to have authority to cast out demons is the third part. But this is so important today, modern times. A lot of times at the seminary, I'll have guys that will come and say, I'm, I'm here to preach. And I'll say, you're here to preach what? Well, they say, well, I'm here to preach sermons. I say, Are you here to preach biblical truth? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, in, I'm in that. You know, what they're saying a lot of times, and it's not so much at the master's seminary as much as some of the other places that I've been. Preaching is not an activity just done by itself. You know what Jesus did? He called them to be his disciples and to be discipled by him. Then to go out to preach. They don't go out to preach yet. 
because he wants them to be with him. Beloved, you leave out that part of the process, then you are, you're not going to have a fruitful ministry if you're in a, any kind of speaking ministry per se. Any kind of true ministry, whether it's a speaking ministry or a serving ministry, is only an extension of our walk with the Lord. And you take away any aspect as that relates to our walk with the Lord, and your ministry will be affected in a negative way. He doesn't want them to preach, which they're going to end up preaching. He wants them to be his disciples. When we come to the book of Acts, we see they have grown a whole, whole lot by that time. When we go through the gospel of Mark, we'll still see them in the process of growing a lot more than, well, when we come to Acts, we'll put it that way. They have grown a whole lot more with us. But this is a real good verse to use if you're discipling someone. Because a lot of times people will want to do something, and that's fine. But we just need to make sure that the relationship with Jesus is at the core of that, then the activity. Not the activity without the relationship to Jesus. Wonderful verse to mark in your Bible and use. And so they've got the 12 down there. Just for time's sake, we're going to drop down to verses 20 and 21. Verse 20, and he came home. And that would be Capernaum at this place. And the multitude gathered again, look at this, to an extent that they could not even eat a meal. That's how busy that they are. And then in verse 21, if you've ever had people in your family say they don't understand you, verse 21 of chapter 3 of Mark. And when his own people, this would be minus Mary, Joseph has probably died at this time. We don't know what happened to Joseph. He just disappears from the scene. But his own people heard of this. They went out to take custody of him. For they are saying he has lost his senses. Now that would be his brothers. That would be his sisters. That would be his cousins and aunts and uncles. I promise you this, Mary is not involved in this group. Mary understands where others can't. And poor James, who wrote the book of James, how would it be to have Jesus as your older brother? And you talk about how hard it is to live up to your older brother's standard, that you would have Jesus as an older brother, half brother in a sense, same mom, different dad with this, but James would be one of those that as far as he's concerned, I mean, no angels appeared to him saying that this is the Messiah, my brother that I grew up with in tiny Nazareth. This is the Messiah, the promised one. And so they had a hard time with this. Again, other than Mary, Mary would be very confident in the sense of who Jesus is and what is taking place. When we come to Mark chapter 3 verse 22 all the way over to Mark chapter 4 verse 34. So this is chapter 3 verse 22 to Mark chapter 4 verse 34. We're going to have to do something that is a little bit different. From Mark chapter 3, verse 22, to chapter 4, verse 34, it on the inspired outline, this is why it's up here, Mark chapter 4, verse 34. We're going to do something different with this. We're going to have to go to Matthew's gospel, and we're going to get there by way of Daniel chapter 12. So if you want to turn over to Daniel chapter 12, we're going to tie some things together. And the reason that we're doing this is that there is much more information given in Matthew's account, and you'll see why with this. Mark's account is very, very brief. And we're going to go through the Matthew account. I don't know if we'll have time to go through the Mark one, but it's going to be the parallel passage. If we miss this, this would be a good one to read on your own. It won't take you that long to read. But the reason we're doing the part in Daniel and the part in Matthew. These are the same passages. Jesus gives so much more information and we'll see this in Matthew's account. Now we're starting in Daniel chapter 12, just very, very briefly. 
Chapter 12, verse 1, Now at that time Michael, the great prince, who guards over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who's found written in the book, will be rescued. This is talking about the Jewish people, and this is talking about the coming tribulation. There's coming a time for the last seven years before Jesus returns to earth. It's going to be unlike any other time in the history of the world. If we had time to go through this, we go through Matthew 24 and 25, where Jesus goes into a great amount of detail. He says in verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Two options and two options only. It's either heaven or it's either hell. There's no middle ground with this, no third opportunity. And the reason we're doing this, if you will, drop down to the last verse in the book of Daniel. Now we have left out a lot out of the book of Daniel. Um, for obvious reasons, but here is what we want to get to. Verse 13 of Daniel. But as for you, go your way to the end, then you will enter into your rest and rise again for your allotted portion. Now there's a phrase, this is the first time that this is used in the Bible. At the end of the age. This is the first time that the end of the age is used. There are five times in Scripture that the end of the age is used. We're going to see that as we go through Matthew's Gospel, but this is the first one. And this is a good verse to use about the Old Testament resurrection and reward for Old Testament people. It's not just Daniel who is going to be raised from the dead when the Lord returns and have your allotted portion. It's all of the people saved in the Old Testament. It's all of the Jews in this particular context. So Daniel, don't worry about what's going to happen now. You're going to end up going to the grave. You're an older man at this point. You're going to enter into your rest. You're going to rise again, resurrection. And you're going to have the allotted portion given to you. This is going to be at the end of the age. Now, that being said, let's fast forward over to Matthew. Chapter 3, just going to note some things and move on with this. Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist appears. We have seen this already. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the kingdom of heaven was at hand because the king had been born and the king was getting ready to minister among them. This is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, crying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way, the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So the message is very, very simple, repent. Why? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Nobody had to come to John the Baptist and say, what are you talking about the kingdom of heaven? All the Old Testament references about the kingdom of heaven, about what's going to take place during the kingdom, when the king reigns. And so repent, bring yourself in covenant obedience, Jewish people. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. In chapter 4 of Matthew, verse 12, when he heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. We're familiar with that. But look at Jesus' message in chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say the exact same thing that John the Baptist did. Repent. Why? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same message, identical word for word as John the Baptist in chapter 3. Fast forward over to Matthew chapter 10 where we started this morning. In Matthew chapter 10... Verses 5 through 7, this is after he has named the 12 disciples to become 12 apostles with designated power and authority. But in Matthew chapter 10, these 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, do not enter into any of the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And if you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
The kingdom of heaven is at hand because the king is among them. Now, he doesn't sit on his throne yet. Herod sits on the throne as a usurper. Herod doesn't belong there, and Herod is a fallen man anyway. And so when we come to Matthew chapter 12, this is the parallel passage to Mark chapter 3 and Mark chapter 4 up to verse 34. And this is why we're doing this. It has much more information given, makes much more sense in Matthew's gospel. In chapter, chapter 13, verse 1, let's just note this. On that day, right on what day? You have to back up to Matthew chapter 12. Now, there's a possibility this could go all the way back to Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Then there was brought to him a demon-possessed man who was blind and dumb, and he healed him so that the dumb man spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and began to say, this cannot be the son of David, can he? This cannot be the promised Messiah, can he? Now the Pharisees, verse 24, the religious leaders of the time, the Pharisees heard it, they said, this man cast out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. They cannot deny the miracle. They deny the source of the miracle. This man is not sent by God. This man is sent by Satan. Now, beloved, this is where the unpardonable sin occurs. Matthew chapter 12, verses 30. Whoever is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the, whole, the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever shall speak against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him either in this age or the age to come. And let's just put this in very, very simplistic terms of what Jesus has done. He has shown himself with many proofs to be the promised Messiah. He has spoken as one having authority. He has cast out demons. He has quieted the storm. He has healed. He has raised the dead even. The religious leaders, the, the miracles are, are of such a degree that he can, they cannot deny the miracles. They say, the religious leaders, he is of Satan, he is not of God. Now it is this time that Jesus comes, on that day he could come with this. Now he is going to do something that he hasn't done before. After Matthew chapter 12, in the very simplest terms, the kingdom is still going to come. It is just not going to come operative word yet. The message is going to change in Matthew 13. The method is going to change. No longer are they going to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And no longer is Jesus going to speak as he does on the Sermon on the Mount. Now he is going to speak to them in parables. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and great multitudes gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole multitude was standing on the beach. And look at what it says. He spoke many things to them in parables. Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed some seeds, fell beside the road, and the birds came and devoured them. Others fell upon the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out, and others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And look what takes place in Matthew 13, verse 10. The disciples came to him and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? We've been with you about two and a half years, give or take. Somewhere in that neighborhood. You've never done this before. 
Why are you speaking to them in parables? Here's the answer to Jesus gives. Verse 11, he answered and said to them, to you, it has been granted to know, look at this, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it has not been granted. So the parables are going to give an explanation of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So instead of saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is the hand, now Jesus is going to tell in the parables what is going to happen from that point until, and we'll see, actually to his return. In verse 12, for whoever has to him shall more be given, and he shall have an abundance, but whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. This has absolutely nothing, N-U-T-T-I-N, nothing to do with money. This has to do, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 12, with biblical truth. What a promise. And if you mark your Bibles, that's a great verse to mark. To the extent that you receive God's truth, act on God's truth as best you can. You have God's promise that he'll give you more truth and more truth and more truth as you walk with him. Later on, Peter will write, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace is from the inside out. Knowledge part is played with that. What a wonderful promise. But he is talking especially about the leaders of the nation of Israel who says that he is of Satan, not of God. The little bit of biblical information that they have is going to be taken from them. So parables are going to be used to either reveal information or to conceal information. It all depends on the relationship that the person has to Jesus. If they are walking with Jesus such as the apostles are, then they are going to receive more information and more information and more information. But if you do not believe God's word, whether you're the religious leaders here or you bring it up to the modern day world, it's a dangerous thing to reject the word of God. Whether you're a person or a couple or a church or a denomination or a country or a society, it's a dangerous thing to reject the word of God. And so therefore I speak to them in parables, verse 13, because while seeing they do not see, while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand In this case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. And he's going to quote out the last part of Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 is one of the great missionary send-off passages. Has, whom shall I send? Here I am, send me. Sounds good. When you go to Isaiah 6, Steve Lawson mentioned this yesterday. Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord, high in his altar, lifted up. And Isaiah says, woe is me, I'm a man of, I'm ruined, I'm a man of unclean lips, and the people are in the bits of unclean lips. God commissions Isaiah to go, and in Isaiah chapter 6, he tells Isaiah to go to a people that are seeing, but they will not see, while hearing, they will not hear. And God says even, I have hardened their heart. Now, the people of Isaiah's time, let's put it this way. God had given his word to the nation of Israel. The people had rejected God's word. God sends Isaiah and tells them, yeah, you, if this is modern society, you're not going to have a mega church, you're not going to write books, and you're not going to do conferences. Isaiah, nobody's going to listen to you because God has hardened their heart. And the reason God has hardened their heart is because the people has turned away from God's word. There was a remnant that God kept. He always keeps a remnant. There was a remnant that God kept. But the majority of the people of Isaiah's time did not receive Isaiah's message. As far as we know, and this is kind of in, we would say, church history, but this is Old Testament. According to Jewish tradition... Isaiah was sawn in half by one of the kings. That's how his message was received. And what Jesus does is take the Isaiah 6 passage and move it up to the present time. 
the people, the religious leaders, have rejected the word of God. They've rejected the written word of God. They've rejected the incarnate word of God. While seeing, they do not see. While hearing, they do not hear. The eyes of this people have become glazed over. I have hardened their hearts. Look at the difference with this. In verse 16, but blessed are your eyes, 12 disciples, because they see, and your ears, because they hear, and put me down in this category of verse 17. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, such as Daniel, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. I can't wait to find out all the things that Jesus did. I can't wait to find out all the things that he said. I don't think it's an exaggeration when it said all the books of the earth could not contain what Jesus did. We just have a smidgen of what Jesus did revealed in the Gospels. And so blessed are your eyes, minus Judas, blessed are your eyes. And Jesus is not going to say to Judas, you know, is Judas there? He's not going to say, blessed are your eyes, except you. Because it's not until the end that he will reveal that he knows who Judas is. But let's keep going. Look at verse 18. Here the parable of the sower. So he's going to explain what he just said. Verse 19, when one hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown. Is it not amazing that any of us are saved? That there was an actual attempt by Satan to keep you from receiving the word of God. I tell you what, if you're witnessing or teaching or preaching the word of God, you preach and witness with one part of your mouth and you pray out of the other part. There's a spiritual battle that's going on with this. So when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, verse 19, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. And the one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but it's only temporary when affliction or persecution arises because of the word. Immediately he falls away. Verse 22, and the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word. And the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And then in verse 23, And the one on whom the seed was sown on the good ground, this is your man who hears the word, understands it, who indeed bears fruit, some brings forth, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Different soil, same gospel, different reception to the word of God. So now, instead of the kingdom of heaven is at hand, now there's going to be different receptions to the word of God. And look at what he does. Every one of these are going to be a kingdom of heaven parable. Look at what it says. We'll just mark these. We're going to come back to this one. Look at verse 24. He presented another parable to them, saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to... Look at verse 31. He presented another parable saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. He is not telling people how to live a good life. He is not telling them how to have success business-wise. These are kingdom of heaven parables. This is telling about now instead of the kingdom coming in, this is what's going to take place in the middle part in between the king and his kingdom Verse 33, he spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took. We're going to come back to some of these just very briefly. Chapter 13, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in the field, which a man found and hid. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. Verse 47, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. You won't miss this. You can just kind of do your word search about kingdom of heaven. There is no parable that he gives in Matthew 13 that does not start off with, in essence, the kingdom of heaven. Other than the first one that he gives and then the explanation of that. 
shows that he is talking about the kingdom of heaven. And this is the parallel passage to what we would be doing in Mark. But here is part of the information that God wants us to understand. Look what it says. I'm over in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. And he presented another parable to them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares. Or you could put it this way. I don't know what your translation showed or sowed weeds. Now in an agricultural setting, and this is how you made your living. This was a high-handed sin. That you would go to your enemy's field and you would purposely take weeds and sow it among the crop. There's only a certain amount of moisture, only a certain amount of nutrients, only a certain amount of soil. You purposely do this to rob. I mean, this, this would be, this may be a big crime in that setting. And this would be something they, they would kill somebody over this. If someone had purposely sowed weeds among the wheat and went away, verse 26, when the wheat sprang up and bore grain, then the tares or the weeds became evident also. It's fascinating. I'm sure a botanist could understand this. In the springtime, when the grass and the wheat come up, or the weeds and the wheat come up, when you're standing there side by side, you can't tell the difference. Now, when they start off, you just can't tell the difference from a visual standpoint. I'm sure under the microscope, yes, you can. I was out walking and praying at a place in North Carolina. We were actually visiting Betsy's grandmother while she was still living. And I'm out walking and praying, and I saw a sign in somebody's garden that said, a weed is just an unloved flower. Now, beloved, this is some kind of ex-hippie type stuff, that a weed is just an unloved flower. Really. And I'm, I'm standing talking out loud to this thing, and I don't know if anybody saw me inside with it. You know, a weed is a weed because it's part of the curse of Genesis chapter 3. How would you like to take that weed, poison ivy, or poison oak? Y'all don't have that over here, do you? Do y'all have poison ivy, poison oak? You take that to your bosom. And you will not rise, you won't say a weed is just an unloved flower. Clothe yourself with that stuff and see what you say. I mean, a weed is a weed because that's what it is. And there's nothing that changes from this. A weed is a weed from the germ all the way, all the way up. And so, the, again, two categories, two categories. The weeds are good stuff and the weeds are the bad stuff. And what happens with this Verse 26, and when the wheat sprang up and bore grain, then the wheat or the tares became evident also. And the slaves of the landowner said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares or weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he says, No, lest while you are gathering up tares or weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Allow them both to grow until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares or the weeds and bind them in bundles to burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barns. Now, beloved, look at this. Verse 34. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables. And was not talking to them without a parable. But look, at, we're dropping down to verse 36 and following. Then he left the multitudes and went into the house. And his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares or the weeds of the field. Now they asked for the explanation. This is one that is given in Scripture. And look at what it says. This is so important in understanding the gospel. Gospel story, whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. So here is Jesus' explanation, verse 37. He answered and said to them, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, and the field is the world, 
And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the weeds, and sons of the evil one. Sometimes sons talk about the male part. Sometimes sons is just a covering word for male and female. This would be one that's male and female. This is not limited just to men. And so the tares are the sons of the evil one. Look at verse 39 if you mark your Bible. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And look at this. The harvest is the end of the age. This is the second time that the end of the age is used. The first time was Daniel chapter 12, verse 13. Go your, go your peace, Daniel. Go rest. You're going to be awakened, rise to receive your portion at the end of the age. Now, what Jesus is doing now is totally different than what the earlier message was from John the Baptist and what the earlier message was from Jesus, what the earlier message was from the twelve. Now, instead of saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, well, well, sometime on your own in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, Peter says, this is the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God. It's not predetermined plans. It's predetermined plans seeing in Acts 2, 22 and 23. This is not a surprise for Jesus. This is not a oops. This is not what are we going to do now. He came into his own and his own received him not. He understood that was going to take place. He's still king, but now he is talking about end of the age stuff. Now he's talking about Daniel 12 stuff. He wasn't talking about that before. And so when he returns, the age is going to end. That's the second use of this. In verse 39, the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it shall be third time at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's making reference to hell with this. Then the righteous will shine forth. Your Bible have little Old Testament quotations, right, with this in block letters. Does your Bible have that? Just for the record, when Jesus quotes in Matthew chapter 13, verse 34, when he says, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun. He takes that from Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. He wants us to make sure that Daniel chapter 12 plays an important part in the, in the theology. This is not explained as much in the Gospel of Mark. Beloved, one more just real, real quickly. Fourth time that the end of the age is used. In verse 47 it says again, the, dra- uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea. And gathering fish of every kind. And when they had filled it, they drew it up on the beach. And they sat down, they gathered the good fish into containers. But the bad fish they threw away. Here's the fourth time. So it will be at the end of the age. Everything about Matthew. The message has changed. The method has changed. No longer is he talking about the kingdom of heavens at hand. Now he's talking about the end of the age. And at the end of the age, the angels are going to be sent out to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. And two categories only, the good and the bad, the wheat and the weeds, and even in the dragnet. And so you have five times in the Bible that the end of the age is used. One is in Daniel. Four are in Matthew. And we've seen three in Matthew, and I bet you will never again look at this the same way. I'll race you. We're headed to the last use of the end of the age. Matthew chapter 28. Look at what it says. Matthew chapter 28, last verse of Matthew's gospel. I might as well go start in verse 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. This is after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. Baptizing them in the name, singular, not names, of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, or behold, I am with you always, even to, fifth time, the end of the age. You have read over the end of the age so many times, and probably didn't mark the significance. This is so significant. He, when he comes back, this is not just a king that is coming to reign. This is God who's coming to judge. He's going to judge the unrighteous, and he's going to judge the righteous in a good sense and reward that. Now, beloved, it's with this that we go over, and I want you to notice the difference in Mark's gospel. We're over to chapter... Do, 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 do. Over to chapter 3, verse 22. This would be the parallel passage of Matthew 12. Now remember, Matthew's written to a Jewish audience and gave more explanation, more Old Testament references with this. This written to the Gentile audience is going to be briefer. You've got the scribes coming down from Jerusalem saying he was possessed by Beelzebub. He cast out demons by the rulers of demons. That's what we saw in Matthew chapter 12. Look what takes place. We have just four parables in chapter 4. He began to teach them by the seashore. And such a great multitude gathered before him that they got into a boat in the sea and sat down and all the multitude by the seashore of the land. And he was teaching them many things in the parables and saying to them in his teaching. So he does this about the parable of the sower and the soils that we saw. And he showed them in verse 11 to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. And he said, do you not understand the parable? So he goes ahead and talks about the sower. Verse 14, sows the word. This is parallel to Matthew 13. And the ones on the road beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear it, immediately Satan comes. So we have seen that before. He tells them the parable of the seed, the kingdom of God. Verse 26, is like a man who cast seed upon the ground and goes to bed at night and he gets up by day and the seed sprouts and up it grows. How he himself does not know. The earth produces crops and on it goes with this. Verse 30, how shall we picture the kingdom of God or by what parable shall we present it? It's like a mustard seed. Which, even sown on the ground, though it's smaller than all the seeds that are upon the ground, Yet when its sown grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms larger branches so that the birds of the air can take rest in it. And look at verses 33 and 34. And with many such parables, we don't have all the ones that he gave, and many such parables he was speaking the word to them. But look at this real important part, last part of verse 33. He was speaking the word to them as they were able to hear it. Not everybody is on the same spiritual level. Not everybody is on the same spiritual receptivity. So Jesus was speaking the word of God to them. Verse 34, and he was not speaking to them without parables. But it also says he was explaining everything to his own disciples privately. Now, the reason that we went to Matthew 12 and Matthew 13, there is nothing in Mark's gospel about the end of the age. And it plays a very, very important part in understanding the kingdom parables. He's still king and he's still going to reign. Only now we live in the midst of this mystery. From the king who has ascended to the right hand of the father... And we are waiting his return. Now, when you come to the New Testament, you're going to find the church is a mystery. And Ephesians, Ephesians 3 would be a good place to go. Colossians 1 would be a good place to go. 
The church is a mystery. There's no Old Testament prophecies about this. And so we are this kind of little parenthesis, starting in Acts chapter 2, continuing up to the day, continuing whenever the rapture takes place, and I hope it's soon. May very well be soon. After the rapture is going to come Daniel 12, where it talks about a time unlike any other time in history. All of this is tied in with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So everything from this point onward, from Matthew 12 slash 13, Mark chapter 3 slash verse 4, everything is different now. Now he is still king and he's coming back, but he has been rejected by the religious authorities. This would not be the final rejection that they have of him. But he has been presented to the nation. He has been testified to by God with signs and wonders. He has spoke the word of God to them. Some have received, many have not. The religious leaders, when they say, you are of Satan, the game changes. Now again, in Acts chapter 2, we understand it's the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God. This is not whoops. Grab your concordance sometime and look up God and uh uh-oh, or God and whoops, or look up God and what are we going to do now, and see how many hits that you have coming up. Not going to have it. Now, we understand, we live this side of the cross. We know that he's going to be rejected. We know that he's going to be crucified. We know that he is going to be resurrected. They don't know that yet. Kingdom message has changed. Kingdom's still going to come, just not now. Kingdom's going to come, not now, at the end of the age. Daniel, you will arise for your allotted portion. And so the wheat and the tares will be separated, not now, not during the church age. The wheat and the tares will be separated at the Lord's return. We make progress, I hope. This is a little bit deeper. I hope this made sense. I know we had to do this somewhat on the run. It is God in control. As sad as it is to read Matthew 12 and 13, there is still a part, even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's take one quick peek, one verse, and we will turn you over to your prayer partner. One verse, this is where we start tomorrow, verse 35 of chapter 4. On that day, when the evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. We're going to come back there. That's where we're going to start for those who will be here tomorrow. But he is actually going to do something away from Galilee. Yeah, we'll have to put some new part on our, on our inspired outline uh, on the boy. We'll have to add a new part. All right, beloved, I hope this made sense. Let's do this. Why don't you get with your prayer partners about five minutes. Talk about what we have learned out of today's session or even today's sessions. And then we'll come back in about five minutes and I will turn it over to Ross.